Oh, look at that. The screw doesn't keep spinning because I know how to use the trigger. If you don't know how to use the trigger, use the clutch. If you're using an impact, throw it in the trash. This video is brought to you by Sporlin. Quality, integrity, and tradition. The complaint today is that the kitchen AC is not working properly. We have a Linux package unit. I believe this to be a 15 ton. And let's get inside here. We've got an error message on the M17 board of 15. And if we come over here, 15 says high pressure limit open three times during call basically. So at the moment, looks like First and second stage contactors are not pulled in and we're only running off a third stage. Um, condenser is pretty dirty and pretty smashed up at that. Yeah, it's definitely dusty. And then condenser fan motor wise, all condenser fan motors are running. So we've got some issues here. All right, I'm about to shut down this AC but it's very important to understand your restaurants and how they operate. This one, the fire alarm is tied into the AC and I had to have them put the fire alarm on test so they didn't get a silent signal. Always understand the operation of your restaurants, okay? So this one they have, and I've showed it many times, they tied into the duct detector. Uh, when the duct detector has a trouble condition, it signals the fire alarm company. Now it just sets off a trouble, not a fire alarm, but it, it makes the alarm company call the restaurant basically i prefer to pull the blow the side of the panel off to be able to access the condensers when i do that what you get to see is the coil cleaning company how lazy they've been you can see that they've only been cleaning from the little coil cleaning access that's right here and you can see by the damage in the condenser nobody's been doing this correctly um, you can also see down here that this condenser's well, I can see it. I don't know if you guys can see it, but it's pretty damaged too. It's really flattened out in a bunch of spots, really bad. And that's from people not cleaning it properly. Same thing right here. You can see how damaged the condenser is. There's gonna be a point in time when this condenser is not gonna be cleanable anymore. But I pull both sides off, so that way uh, we can access everything and I'll knock it out real quick. Went ahead and pulled the metal mesh filters out too. Now I'm doing a thorough job on this AC. I am gonna rinse their other ACs too, but I don't know if I'm gonna go as crazy on those because they didn't call me here for those. So I'll leave it up to the customer and see what they wanna do. So we start by rinsing the outside of the condenser, just getting the big stuff off. You know, I already gave it a quick little rinse. So we get the big stuff off, get the bulk of the dirt out, you know, just the surface stuff. Do the same thing on the inside. Just get saturating the condenser because you want plenty of uh, of a, you want a smooth surface essentially for the coil cleaner. Now this inside condenser is truly damaged, really bad. That's all flattened from people. Like, I mean, water's barely even coming through, you know, as opposed to coming over here. I don't know, it's just, it sucks. But just saturate, rinse the big stuff off, and then we're gonna apply the cleaner and let it do its magic. I'm using the brightener cleaner because uh, this thing's just so impacted with dirt, I need the foaming action. So normally I would only use this in greasy situations, but um, now I'm going to clean multiple condensers, so I went ahead and, and put a lot in my coil gun, but you don't need this much to clean one condenser. It's going to do a lot. Uh, so I already gave it one coat. All that we're going to do is uh, I usually spray on the C setting right there. And then uh, we're just going to start from the bottom and work our way up, just letting it penetrate and do it from the inside and the outside, getting a nice and good it is not a race. You literally have to go row by row, nice and slow to make sure you get it all out. See, because if I just run through here real quick, you know, boom, 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 like most, you know, just bam, 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 bam. It's not going through and it's not getting it all. You gotta be thorough. You gotta make sure that you're going row by row, nice and slow to make sure that you're getting all the stuff and don't be afraid to reapply. You see how it's going slow right there? Okay, so once I get done cleaning it, I'm probably gonna do it again. I had gotten most of the surface stuff off, so I wanted to do another cleaning, but this time I used just the standard uh, Venom Pack, the yellow pack, and uh, just let it sit. The Venom Pack, the yellow pack, uh, you, you, the condensed core cleaner, you let that stuff sit for like 10 minutes, let it really do its magic. 
But yeah, we're coming through a lot better now. Not really seeing as much dirt, but I'm just doing that once over just to make sure. Yeah, looking good. But this is just one block of condenser. I have three more to go as far as the slabs go. Oh, look at that. The screw doesn't keep spinning because I know how to use the trigger. If you don't know how to use the trigger, use the clutch. If you're using an impact, throw it in the trash. Getting ready to power the unit back on and I noticed the belt's extremely loose. So I'm gonna go ahead and tighten that up, but also feeling the pulley, the pulley's worn out. I don't know how well this will come across on camera, but it's, uh, it's grooved pretty good in there. It doesn't really show it too well right there. But yeah, it's got a nice little groove going on. So we'll talk to the customer about that. I don't have the pulley, but I'm going to tighten up the belt. But we got to be careful because of those grooves. If you tighten it too tight and the pulley's worn a certain way, the belt will get stuck in there. If you want to test whether a belt is going to get stuck in the pulley, what I do is pull down on the belt like this in a straight line. Okay, get your hands about this far down. You pull down and then while you're tight, while you still have it pull, uh, tightened, you push it up. If the pulley's going, or if the pulley's worn enough, so you see how my hand, if the pulley's worn enough, the belt will actually get stuck in there. And if you tighten that up extremely tight, then you're gonna start breaking belts or overloading the motor, okay? So again, pulling it straight down, pushing it up, nothing. Now, this pulley, you guys can see. I mean, I don't even need to go get the pulley gauge to see that it has an arched lip. A pulley, or a sheave, whatever you wanna call it, is supposed to be straight angles, not curved like it is right now. Okay, so that's a problem. That's worn down, and uh, loose belts certainly don't help. In my opinion, the loose belts actually wear down the pulley faster. So we're gonna get this guy tightened up and uh, push it back in. I got the belt snugged up, but I'm not gonna go full tension, okay? Because um, I still don't want it to get stuck in there. Even though it's not getting stuck with my test, I'm still not gonna go crazy, sit crazy tight. Um, so that's good enough for now. Make sure when you're tightening these things too, you tighten them, you, you do the adjustment screws evenly. And always wanna double check. I usually sometimes grab a tape measure and measure the distance here and the distance there because the guy before you could have been wrenching and this whole thing could be crooked. You can also look at it and visually inspect it. This one doesn't look bad. Maybe a little bit off, but I don't think it's worth my headache right now, especially when we're still gonna change the, the pulley. The unit is running. All the condenser fan motors are running now. Um, I'm gonna let it run for a little while for about an hour or two while I clean the other condensers and then we'll uh, We'll go through. I'm just getting started on cleaning this one right now These ones are not nearly as bad the kitchens are always the worst So this one will just take the regular condenser coil cleaner and the yellow venom pack real quick. Give it a rinse It's been running for a little bit now and uh, when I was clearing the drain I noticed something in here Which I was already gonna put my gauges on it anyways but look at that, uh, I believe it's the second stage TXV. It's frosting, it's probably low on charge. So we're gonna have to dig into that. Um, all the other ACs are running. Knowing this customer, they've got an exhaust fan not running too, and that's not normal. All their exhaust fans should be running. There, there's only one switch here. So yeah, all but this one are running. So. I'm gonna look into that too. Uh, at least drive a return visit probably. Cause they're not even complaining about it. But again, big picture guys. I went ahead and rinsed all the other condensers. All the ACs are back on, the belts are all good. So we need to dive into that uh, refrigerant charge issue. And then this exhaust fan not working. I'm gonna take lunch though. Cause it's 100 degrees outside right now and I need a break. I've been drinking water like a fish, but still need to uh, take a break, cool off for a little while. All right, my first stage um, doesn't look horrendous. A 47 degree evaporator, 126 degree condensing temp. Um, this is a R22 15 ton unit. Superheat's a little bit high, but I will say that we are running 100% outside air on this unit, which is very peculiar. It's not meant for that, but because of their air balance, the outside air dampers opened all the way. Uh, Subcooling's not bad. It's kind of a Frankenstein situation here. I'm not really seeing anything wrong with the first stage. The approach is a little bit low, which could possibly indicate an overcharge, but 14 degree subcooling or 15 degree subcooling, that's not bad for these Linux units. They actually don't tell you to check the subcooling. They tell you to pay attention to approach. Um, I'm not seeing a discharge line temps okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm fine with this one. We're gonna go ahead and jump onto the second stage and see what's going on with that. All right, we're on our second stage now. 
Um, so we've got a low evaporator temperature, 21 degrees. Look at my superheat. I've got extremely high superheat. I've got extremely high subcooling. My head pressure is kind of on point with where it should be. Our approach temperature is zero. Uh, this thing is not low on charge. I, I said low on charge earlier, assuming looking at the expansion valve, but no, we've got a plugged up metering device and or restricted filter dryer. So there's something going on with this expansion valve. Causing it to frost like that. It's not feeding correctly. Yeah. Be careful near that pulley too. There's an issue with the valve. We need to talk to them about replacing that expansion valve. Um, based on that subcooling, I mean, basically it could be overcharged too, theoretically, but um, let me make sure real quick one thing. Let me make sure my probes are, are correct. So low pressure, high pressure, suction line temp is 99. Good gosh, that's a hot suction line temp. That's not 99. What is going on here? Something's not right. I think I might have... No? Discharge line temp, 297. Suction line temp, 99. That seems a little odd, but... Yeah, I was worried about the discharge line temp and the liquid line temp. That is strange, though. Let me see. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that suction line temp is 99 degrees. Yeah, we've got no cooling coming back to the compressor, essentially. So, um, yeah, we've got an expansion valve issue there. All the condenser fan motors are running. And it's possible that someone put too much gas in here, but look at our suction pressure and our evaporator temperature. We're too low. So, we have got a restriction for sure. Um, I'm going to go ahead and jump over to the second stage, or third stage, I should say. So, we know we've got an issue with the second stage. Um, probably wouldn't be a bad idea to completely disconnect that because we're going to end up with compressor failure, to be honest with you. So, uh, yeah, I'm going to go ahead and disconnect this bad boy and uh, completely remove it. That way we don't potentially short the compressor because the discharge temp is too high. I'll tape that up. Um, I'd rather do that than have a grounded out compressor later. Third stage looks okay, no major issues. Um, the target for the suction pressure is messed up, but again, this is 100% outside air unit. It's not meant to run that way, but that's the way it's running because of the air balance issues here. Um, but everything else is looking fine. Superheat is, you know, a little bit high, but we've got everything. Yeah, I'm fine with that. I'm fine with that. The unit's performing half-ass okay, except for that second stage. 19 degree split, yeah. All right, so we're gonna talk to the customer. We're gonna give them a quote to change the expansion valve liquid line dryer on the second stage, um, and then uh, change that uh, blower pulley and see what they wanna do. But the unit's cleaned up, working as good as it can. So you can't just assume because we had a high pressure issue that cleaning the condenser solved it. Gotta look at the big picture. And uh, there's no sense in leaving that compressor running that second stage because it's just gonna burn up basically if there isn't already damage. So we came back today because we were gonna go ahead and uh, replace this uh, liquid line valve. And I wanna show you guys something that's going on here. Um, we're basically pumping down because the expansion valve is not letting any refrigerant through. We have a restriction in the expansion valve, essentially. Let's get a discharge pressure instead of a liquid pressure. Let me see what that is. Um, there you go. So we've got a really interesting restriction. Look at that sub, well that's discharge pressure though. That's interesting. 
extremely hot compressor. Let's try this again. Just shut off on what? 24? Low pressure, it just shut off on low pressure. That compressor didn't sound very good when it started up either. Let's uh, it's gonna reset right now, but I wanna put this back on here and make sure that it's truly about expansion out before we go any further. It made a funky sound when I started it. I was kinda worried. I was hoping I could catch it on camera. Um, the other thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna open up and uh, check out the dryer and we're gonna do a visual on the dryer to make sure it's not restricted. Let's get this guy to restart. We're gonna reset the unit. And it should start back up. Again, we're looking at liquid pressure right now. Sounds interesting. But yeah, we clearly have a restriction somewhere because let's check that dryer. Oh yeah, we've got a restriction in the dryer. There's a temperature differential. It's cold coming out of the dryer. It's warm right here. But the question is, this is a factory dryer. Why is it restricted? Something's floating in the system. Okay, I'm still gonna change the expansion valve. Um, but yeah, we had a, a massive temperature differential. It's cold coming out of the dryer. It's, it's warm going into the dryer. So this guy is plugged up for sure. Um, we're gonna make sure we put a spoiling catch-all in there. And uh, I don't think much has ever been done to this. I don't think we've ever done leak repairs on it, which kind of makes me worry. Why is it plugged up? Unless something blew apart in the system. Interesting. Well, we're gonna get to it. We're gonna start recovering. So what I'm gonna do, because it's really hot here, um, and it's gonna get really hot in the kitchen, is we're gonna go ahead and recover the gas. We've got the compressor disconnected. I'm gonna go ahead and tape it up again. We'll recover while the other compressors are running. We'll do everything we can with the system still running, and then we'll only shut it off to change the dryer and to change the expansion valve. Got the core removal tools on. Um, remove the Schraders, make it go faster. You certainly could make it go faster to use 3 8 hoses right here. Uh, what I went in out and do, I'm not in a huge hurry today, was I used the standard quarter inch hoses into the gauges, then I used a 3 8 hose out, 3 8 hose to the tank. Now, I've got a dryer running, uh, cleaning the refrigerant as it's coming out. In a perfect world, I'd have the dryer that goes in the other direction, but this is all I had in my van. I really am gonna try to reuse this refrigerant, so that's why I have the dryer on there. Now, also on the field piece uh, recovery machine, there actually is a strainer right here too that theoretically would catch any debris or anything, okay? But it's always good to use a dryer too. I don't always use them, but in this situation, we know we have a restriction in here, so that's why I'm doing it. Um, what I'm gonna do is leave this loose right here. Everything's off, this is a vacuum down cylinder. We're gonna go ahead and open up. Open up on here. And we're purging, see? We're purging all the air out of the lines, okay? There we go. Now we're purged. Um, theoretically, I should purge this high side right here. There we go. Now we're good, now we're good. We can go ahead and open up. Open up, everything's open. Everything's open. Make sure I tighten this guy on. That guy was a little bit loose, but I tightened it on. Um, we're gonna go ahead and invert my cylinder. I'm pumping in through the vapor port to try to uh, ease any restrictions going through the liquid dip tube. We're gonna go into the vapor port. We're gonna invert it on the, the scale and uh, We'll get going after that. Gonna go ahead and zero out the scale on the manifold. The field piece wireless scale does connect with the S-Man 480. So now, when I open this up, we're now pushing refrigerant into the cylinder. I have not turned on the recovery machine yet. We'll push in what we can, and then we'll turn it on. Uh, remember, this machine has an auto shut off if you wanna use that feature. Just be careful if you have systems that have leaks. I don't anticipate this one having a leak but we will monitor it as we see how much refrigerant we pull out of the system. So um, let's move this over just a little bit, a little bit better. And we're gonna go ahead and hit start. It's in recovery mode, we're running. You watch your discharge pressure coming out the machine. If you start to notice really high discharge pressure, um, you can always dip your cylinder in an ice bath 
Um, you know, removing the Schraders and stuff is really gonna help out because it eases restrictions. But all right, we're gonna let this guy run. Uh, system's open, nitrogen's flowing through. We're gonna go ahead and cut this dryer out. I sanded it up extra long. We're gonna cut it out because I wanna see if I can see what the restriction is. All right, we're gonna purge through the system. Let's see if anything comes out of this guy. It's a bunch of oil. What was in there was a five cubic inch dryer. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and oversize the dryer. We're gonna put a catch all in there. Uh, we're gonna go with the 16 cubic inch. I don't know what caused the restriction yet, but I do know that whatever it is, I don't want it to plug up the new dryer potentially. So we're gonna go with a bigger dryer. We will have to compensate in the refrigerant charge a little bit, uh, but we'll make sure we get it in there and get it strapped down appropriately. That didn't take, I need to quit my job and go become a computer dude. Yep, it took. Everything is in, we're giving it a good nitrogen sweep. And then we're gonna go ahead and uh, do a standing pressure test, but I need to put actual gauges on for that. All right, TXV's installed, re-secured, sensing bulbs nice and safe and mounted back there. Um, I was lucky in that there was enough play in everything to be able to cut it and not have to unsweat it. So it's all good, we're currently running a pressure test and we're gonna get started on changing these uh, pulleys and sheaves. When I recovered the charge, the unit had the full charge in it, plus a couple extra ounces, which I had started to add the other day. Um, I've been doing a pressure test for five minutes. It's lost 0.2, I'm, I'm fine with that. So we're gonna go ahead and finish this thing and pull an evacuation now. Currently purging the nitrogen out of the system, but I oftentimes like to check my vacuum pump to make sure that it's actually pulling down. Now, I don't expect it to hold this, but yes, it pulled down. We're at 40 microns and it'll keep going if I keep letting it, but pretty confident everything is working properly on this pump. So we're gonna go ahead and hook everything up and get started. Went ahead and uh, cut the dryer open. Let's see what's going on in here. Why did this guy plug up? All right, that thing was just plain dirty. I mean, it's, it's comprised of this foam pad crap, just layers and layers of this compressed together. But essentially, this is the outlet. And uh, that was pretty much blocked. Actually, this was the inlet. No, this was the outlet, yeah. Right? Yeah, I'm pretty sure that was the outlet. Um, what I ended up putting in there was a Sporlin catch-all dryer. And I have a, a breakaway of a catch-all. And you can see what it's comprised of, the desiccant material right here. Um, so the refrigerant's gonna flow through the desiccant, then run through a media strainer then out of the dryer um, 
these, I've heard horror stories about this stuff breaking up and getting through the system. I've personally never seen it, but I've just seen horror stories. Um, but yeah, so, I mean, there's nothing like, it's not full of oil or anything, but this is just full of junk. Really bad. So that's why I went ahead and changed the TXV too. I'm gonna go ahead and open up the TXV because I kind of looked in it and there was some goo in there. All right, I went ahead and disassembled the TXV, but look at, there's like a, a sludge in there, some kind of sticky goo. And if you look at the spring, it's also got the sticky goo on it. It's nasty, like sludge-like. Look at the pin, same thing. So I contemplated not changing the TXV, but I went ahead and uh, when I cut the liquid line, I looked inside and I was like, oh yeah, for sure. Because it just looked like there's something in there. I don't know what it is. Hopefully the new catch-all should help to clean that up. Um, whatever's going on inside there. I would assume being that this is the third stage and it rarely gets cleaned properly, this unit's been running pretty dirty for a while. A customer doesn't do regular maintenance. Um, they're probably messing with the oil. The oil's probably getting cooked in that compressor, which isn't good. Um, we'll have to monitor it. Maybe get them to let us come back and do a follow-up and make sure that dryer, that new dryer is not plugging up. We're replacing the pulleys. Um, we matched everything to what the other one as far as how far it was open. On this one right here, we're just setting the taper depth. Now, the important thing on this is once you find your your center point you know with the, the belts and the pulleys you can line it up that way what you do is you push the taper in a little bit further because what's going to happen is when you tighten it it's going to pull the pulley onto the taper okay so this was my mark it's probably a little bit too far but I it looks like it's okay so now we're going to slowly tighten these guys you get them snug and then you do even quarter turn quarter turn and keep doing so until the pulley comes onto the taper nice and good or bushing whatever you want to call it I had to take it all apart because when I went to go tighten the set screw right here I realized that the set screw was sitting on the shaft and it was not sitting on the key so I was able to get in there with the flashlight I don't know if I'll be able to show you guys yeah and I can actually see the key now but before the whole pulley basically the set screw would have been just tightening down on the shaft so you want it on the key because the key basically gives it that grip to make sure it doesn't spin off this is the key, but this one you can't see because it's pushed all the way in. So we're just redoing it right now. It's now hitting the key, and we're just going to line it up accordingly. Still running. We're looking good. We're at 535. I still need to valve it off. Actually, it should be running like that to get the trapped air out. But we're going to let that run for a while, and then I'll shut this one down. Uh, yeah, we're going to probably take a line to let this vacuum keep running. Currently testing my decay right now. Uh, it's at about 822 microns and it's been running for about five minutes in the decay test uh, so i'm pretty confident we don't have any leaks i'm going to go ahead and pull down again though because i think we've got some non-condensable some moisture something in there obviously contaminants of some sort but it's looking good so we're going to go ahead and uh pull down some more i was pretty satisfied with where it decayed at last time, but I went ahead and just let it pull down one more time. So we're pulling down again, it's at 550 right now. <clears throat> I'm kind of getting everything ready to charge this unit up. I kind of went back and forth. Um, I decided to go ahead and reuse the existing refrigerant. Now, I'm a little worried about it because whatever contaminants were in the system, whatever plugged up the dryer, in theory, is it gonna plug up, you know, is it in the refrigerant, who knows? Do we have non-condensables, moisture? Um, what I'm doing is, is I'm using the catch-all dryer and I'm gonna filter the liquid as it's coming out It's gonna make the charge go a little bit slower, but again I'm trying to clean that refrigerant so I can reuse it and save the customer some money uh, It is R22 refrigerant. We're putting back into this system I'm still gonna have to use a little bit of my R22 because I'm never gonna get everything out of this cylinder <laughs> So but I'm just trying to be as conservative as possible. So Charging with my smart probes. Um, what I'm doing is just blasting in the high side. I have the compressor terminal disconnected because everything else is still running. We're putting as much gas into the high side as we can. We're currently at two pounds right now. Um, so we're just gonna let it go like that. And then once it won't take any more into the high side, then we'll switch it over, start the compressor up and charge it on the low side. 
All right, it was uh, done taking it on the high side. It took about four pounds. Um, what I went ahead and did was pulled off the port, put it onto the low side, turned the system off. The way that I turned it off was by um, putting it into unit test mode. And then I'll actually turn it on. And we're gonna finish charging through the low side once it starts up. Watching the gauges on the manifold or on the uh, tablet over there. Adding refrigerant as we speak, making sure I don't overload it, using this ball valve as my guy right here. A little bit out of time, we're at five pounds. It takes uh, 11 pounds, eight ounces of R22. Pretty confident that we're not gonna flood it with liquid because we're feeding through a low loss fitting right there, and we're feeding through a Schrader. So, you know, it's getting metered basically. For precaution, what I ended up doing was I stopped at 10 pounds because that's when I started feeding vapor through from that guy, okay? Um, I only fed liquid out of that guy, and my hopes is that if there's any non-condensables, I'm hoping that it stays in the vapor phase and it come through in the liquid phase. So we still need one pound, eight ounces, to finish the factory charge but then i'm going to add an extra four ounces to compensate for the bigger dryer um, so one pound 12 ounces is what we need all right we just finished we're at one pound 12 ounces the wind's kind of blowing the cylinder around so it's moving a little bit something i wanted to kind of point out i don't think i addressed this on the last video you notice that my measure quick target is a lot higher and you notice that we're maintaining, and all the stages were doing that the last time. Because we're using pressure limiting expansion valves, it doesn't let the system pressure get any higher. So that's why Measure Quick's target is so much higher, because we're pulling a lot of outdoor air, but the expansion valve is actually limiting the pressure. I am very happy with this unit right now. Sub pulling is falling in line. Superheat is extremely high, but again, we have pressure limiting expansion valve, so that superheat number is skewed, okay? Um, so my return air temperature is insanely high. Notice my targets are supposed to be really high. I'm okay with everything going on here right now. My approach temperature is actually a little bit high, indicating an undercharge, but it's not undercharged, trust me. You know, there's a lot of this stuff out there, this kind of equipment that you really have to be able to break down and know what's going on. In this situation, this customer used to have a smart hood system, okay? The smart hood system basically would slow down and speed up their exhaust fans based off of building temperature around the hoods, the exhaust hoods, okay? And um, based off of smoke, they would have like a laser basically running across a photo cell or something, running across the hood, and if that got interrupted by smoke, it would speed up the hoods. Now, the reason why I'm telling you this is because this is why this unit, this AC unit is doing what it did, okay? So this customer, what they realized was that smart hood was costing them more money than it was saving them, or at least that's what they told me, okay? So they actually had us bypass that smart hood system because they were losing drives uh, left and right, basically. Every two, two to three years, they'd have to replace the drives, and they'd have, uh, I think they have five drives per restaurant, and, you know probably 500 restaurants that have the, you know, had the same setup and they were just losing drives left and right. So they actually wanted to get rid of that smart hood system and go to conventional motor starters to protect the three phase motors, which is fine. Okay. It still protects the motors, but here's the problem. They had me do that and I did it. But when I did the bypass for them, a hood bypass, I had to go in there. I had to rewire the whole hood system, make sure that it was tied into the the fire suppression system, make sure that it was tied into the fire alarm, make sure that when they turned on the hoods, it put all the air conditioners into occupied mode. It was actually a rather intricate process of doing this and programming it and setting it up the way that it needed to work, but it created an issue. With the smart hood system, okay, this building didn't have a makeup air unit. They were managed or they were pulling the makeup air through the ACs. That's how they designed the building. They obviously oversized the air conditioning units so that way they can pull the outside air in through. But they weren't pulling in 100% outside air because the smart hood system was never balanced on full speed. Okay, the building was air balanced on low speed because the building ran on low speed majority of the time. And then when the restaurant would get busy, it would speed up to high speed. 
um, you know, and then the building might go a little bit negative for a short amount of time, but then it would slow back down and go to normal operation. That's where the savings came in. Okay. But the customer had us bypass that. So when they had us bypass the VFDs, okay, we pulled them out of the system. We ran the direct drive motors that do not have belts or pulleys. We ran the direct drive motors off of 60 Hertz, 208, three phase. Okay. Well, they ran at full speed now. And the building is extremely negative for the air balance. So when a customer would go to the building and try to open the doors, they couldn't open them. And then if they did get them open, all the air from outside would rush in because the hoods were pulling so much air and they weren't making it up. Okay, so when we bypassed it, what we had to do, I brought to their attention, hey, you guys need to add a makeup air unit to this building. And they said, no, 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 we're not going to do that. They didn't want to add makeup airs. They said, you know, just just pull it in through the air conditioning units. And so we had to open up the kitchen AC 100%. Now, the kitchen air conditioner at this restaurant is the only uh, package unit that has a full-blown economizer. The other ones just have minimum outside air dampers that literally is just a damper, but they're not closing off the building air. So we have the minimum outside air dampers opened you know, a hundred percent, well, not a hundred percent on the other ones. We have them open probably, I'd say 60, 70%, but then the kitchen AC is open a hundred percent. So the kitchen AC and the building is still slightly negative, not, not bad, but it's slightly negative. Okay. So that prevents or presents some problems. Obviously this wouldn't work in a really high humid environment. We don't have humidity here in California very much. Okay. This is in the desert actually, but they have a lot of heat. It's very dry. Um, so it leads to issues. The filters get plugged up really quick because they're pulling outside air and they're full of sand. Um, you know, then you're cooking the, the oil basically in the compressors. And, and I believe that's why the filter dryer plugged up. And I believe that's why the expansion valve had goo in it because the oil essentially is turned into sludge in the system. There's only so much I can do here. What they're going to end up having to do is they're going to have compressor failures pretty soon. Okay. And the customer's aware of this, but it's going to happen. And, you know, I'm probably going to wreck Well, I know them. They're not going to change a compressor in one of these units. They're going to end up replacing it. Okay. Because they've gotten their, uh, full depreciation value out of this air conditioner. It's all about tax write-offs when it comes to these big giant places. Okay. Um, it's all about moving money here and there. And, you know, basically they write this, this air conditioner off there. They've got the full depreciation out of it. You know, it's time to buy a new one tax write-offs, all kinds of fancy stuff. It's way above my head. I'm not smart enough to understand that stuff completely. I got a general idea, but that's what happened here. Okay. That's why this thing was so nasty. That's why there was so many problems. It also doesn't help that they don't do regular preventative maintenance. So on top of pulling hundred percent outside air through this air conditioner, now they've got dirty condensers all the time, you know, and it's just, it is what it is. I, I can't really fight it. I, I guess I should be thankful that they give me the opportunity to repair these units, right? I mean, I get to sell them something and fix something every once in a while. Uh, it's just the game you have to play when you're dealing with these restaurants. You have to be able to walk into these situations and troubleshoot for that. And that makes it difficult when guys aren't used to restaurant work. I'm not saying restaurant work is super technical because by no means. I couldn't walk into a rack room in a supermarket. I wouldn't know my my hand from my butt. I wouldn't know what to do, okay? So I'm not saying these restaurants are the most technical things in the world, but restaurants have their own unique problems. You know, you have user error multiplied by 100 because all the kitchen staff is using the equipment. And then you have stuff like this where, you know, yeah, someone else might just come in and change a compressor and say, yeah, it had a bad compressor, but why? Well, this is why. Okay, they're not going to solve it, but at least we know why. You know, um, same thing, you know, uh, dirty condenser, you know, I didn't just stop at the dirty condenser. I checked everything out, looking, looking at the big picture as usual. You know, I thought it was low on charge, but it actually wasn't. And, and you know, I almost went down the rabbit hole. I really did kind of go down the rabbit hole of thinking it was low on charge. I even went as far as hooking up my refrigerant cylinder and adding about four ounces of refrigerant. And then I was like, wait a minute. Then I looked at that sub coolant and I said, this thing isn't low on charge. You know, and then that's when I was kind of taken from a discharge port to the liquid port. And I was like, wait a minute, you know, this, this is weird. And then I realized we were just backing up refrigerant in the condenser is all we were doing. So crazy. Sometimes you just got to decipher this crazy stuff. I really, really appreciate you guys making it to the end of the video. You guys are awesome. Thank you so, so very much for all the support you guys have been giving me. Remember, we have uh, merch available, hvacrvideos.com. You get these hats. You can help me get rid of some of these shirts behind me. I'm trying to get my office back into shape. I'm going to reorganize some things so I don't have shirts stacked everywhere anymore. 
but I do appreciate it. You guys are awesome. You guys are killing it with these orders. Uh, I think my wife just went to the post office and I think she just shipped out probably another 20 orders today. So you guys are awesome. Thank you guys so very much for helping to support the channel. I'm glad to be able to share the little bit of knowledge that I have with you guys. And uh, yeah, we will catch you guys uh, Friday evenings on the HVAC Overtime Show on the HVAC Overtime YouTube channel. And then also Monday evenings, my live streams on my HVACR videos channel. And uh, yeah, see you later.